Eight years ago, on exactly October 20, 2014, one of the most ambitious men in Indonesia would rise to the national stage and spoke to revolutionary changes to the entire archipelago country. His name was Joko Widodo, and the man who became the country's most famous president ever, sometimes also known as Jokowi, was just a politician hailing from Jakarta, the country's capital. Yet his ambition was not only met in his homeland, but rather all across the world. Global leaders after global leaders recognized him for taking a step that no other Indonesian leader did. He was consistently awarded throughout his life, before and after he became president, for his political approach. At one point in 2020, Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed even renamed a street in Abu Dhabi, United Arab Emirates after him, which goes to show how massively popular his name has been throughout the world. So how did Joko Widodo become so popular, and what led him to become a national phenomenon? Well, one of the most popular aspects of Jokowi is his economic agenda. The Widodo economics, as we term it, has been declaring left and right large and enormous plans for the entire country. They are so huge that people would even doubt that they would happen, yet they did. Jokowi at one point had even set a huge goal for Indonesia, that by 2045, it will be the fourth largest economy in the entire world. Now to understand just how well this entire Widodo economics is, let us go back to the very day he was sworn into office. When Jokowi stepped into office in his first inauguration, he sought to reform many of Indonesia's various industries. In his first 100 days, he and his administration had a historic moment after reforming fuel subsidies, social assistance to the poor, streamlined investment licensing, and virtually no new restrictive regulations on foreign trade. These impactful government policies led Indonesia's economy to stride into new territories. But it also helped push Jokowi's own popularity to skyrocket, since his consistent agendas were initiatives that no previous administration had done. Jokowi's administration was also applauded, as he had pushed for the inclusiveness of women in the rankings. One of the most important aspects he has done was to reshuffle the entire cabinet and ministries. He removed some of them and added new ones. The Jokowi administration also inaugurated two new ministries by merging former ones, namely the Ministry of Public Works and Housing and the Ministry of Environment and Forestry. The reason why government changes are so important is that it helps a country remove unproductive offices. If a country were to face a challenge that can't be fixed, it only means that the challenge is either too large or the ones working on it are not doing enough. Therefore, consistent government reshuffling is necessary. Going back to Jokowi, the major part of his economic reform in his first term was that he announced a concept known as the Indonesia Centuries, a concept that aimed to promote equitable development across the country. This simply means that Jokowi wants to remove the idea that Indonesia's economy is solely pointing towards the island of Java. The Java-centric model, after all, meant that all the investments, government funding, and foreign establishments would only land on that island and would not be experienced anywhere else. But the changes made by Jokowi, it has then opened up many opportunities for the rest of Indonesia's society. It introduced the new capital city of Indonesia, removing the former one which was known as Jakarta. His infrastructure drive was also sought after by the citizens. It was loved and applauded, as it finally addressed the need for a change in the country. His biggest agenda was when he announced his five-year infrastructure plan that cost over 150 billion US dollars which was included in his entire $327 billion pipeline of projects. And so far we have seen many of this entire infrastructure plan today. Some have been constructed, and some are still under construction. The biggest known projects around the country were related to railways, specifically the high-speed railway that is known as the Jakarta to Bandung High-Speed Railway. The economic growth of Indonesia on a year-to-year -year basis, from 2014 to 2019, has seen an average of about 4 to 6 percent every year. And what arguably resulted in his first tenure as president saw this consistent economic growth, reduced inequality and infrastructure reforms. But that was the first term of Jokowi, because five years later his next term would arrive. On his re-election day, he again won the hearts of Indonesians, possibly due to his very unique approach to attending to the Indonesian economy. From here on out, however, new challenges would appear. The COVID-19 pandemic would appear months after his tenure began, and a few years later, the world would see massive sweeps in inflation rates, shortages of everything, and an inconsistent commodity market, which brought many basic goods prices to skyrocket. So far, however, what he has done in his second tenure as well is to continue what he has done in his first. He had pledged more infrastructure investments, and he had aimed to make Indonesia become an economic powerhouse by 2045. 
Amongst the most significant measurements that we can attribute to the Jokowi administration so far is his promotion to the entire manufacturing landscape of Indonesia. One of the key barriers to Indonesia's manufacturing capabilities was due to human capital development. The labor workforce of the country is quite lagging when compared to its neighbors. However, Jokowi has signaled that this will change. The reform needed to become a manufacturing hub of Southeast Asia was implementing the right education for the right people. Hence, the first steps are to be established. The second step of his manufacturing plan is the overall promotion of foreign investments. In the last few years alone, Indonesia has received billions to tens of billions of dollars worth of investment toward manufacturing. Much of these investments were directed toward the country's abundance of nickel. Nickel has become a very crucial component in driving the entire electric vehicle sector, since nickel is important in the creation of batteries. Furthermore, while nickel-led investments were quite expected already due to the country's natural abundance, what really set Jokowi's administration up so far was when he declared a ban on raw nickel exports. This meant that if a foreign vehicle manufacturer wanted to buy nickel, they would need to open a factory in Indonesia and build it out there, rather than import it at a low value cost. This aggressive behavior in upholding Indonesia's value chain was not even limited to this government policy. The other big factor was when they implemented the Indonesia Investment Authority in 2021, which became the country's first ever sovereign wealth fund. Its economic impact so far has been marvelous despite its minimal time in office. His infrastructure agenda likewise had not been stopped. It had continued. His foreign policy, which made the country closer to China, has also paved numerous agendas to be built. The Belt and Road Initiative in Indonesia has been steadily strong. In 2019, the China Gazuba Group led a 1.6 billion US dollar 1,200 megawatt project known as the Data Dian Hydropower Station followed by the construction of 30,000 affordable housing units in West Java province, and further hydropower known as the Kiang A, which cost $1.2 billion. Now, of course, from here on out, many things could still happen to the entire Jokowi economy. However, from what we've seen so far, much of his policies are directed toward the long-term growth aspects of Indonesia, and not directed to the short-term expectation led by a hunger for popularity. After all, when a government in this case, Joko Widodo's, implement strategies to chase after manufacturing, the time span needed to get there takes a long time. It needs to cultivate an environment that favors education, and it needs to seek untouched industries that it can compete with globally, such as its abundance in raw nickel materials, and most important infrastructure programs. Infrastructure programs are widely known not for their short-term economic benefits, but for a longer time horizon. The upcoming high-speed railway of Jakarta and Bandung, for example, would cost billions of dollars of money straight out of the government's pockets and place a huge debt burden on the entire country. But within the next 10 to 20 or even 30 years, the economic benefits of it will be extraordinarily huge. It will bring an unprecedented amount of productivity and trade, and importantly is to reduce the overall vehicle congestion that many of the cities of Indonesia face. Finally, while we have thus so far mentioned his strong views on prosperity, we have yet to mention the things he had failed to do. This is probably the most important, since an individual in any society must understand that the government makes mistakes, and in many cases they're not perfect. However, while they may not have it all, the most important is that their underlying agenda to uphold the entire society is utmost for the good. Now, one of the more perplexing situations surrounding Joko Widodo's administration is democracy. According to many reports, what Joko Widodo has done is impacting independent journalism. When the administration revised the Corruption Eradication Commission in 2019, it sparked mass protests due to a detachment from democracy. Furthermore, in the latest democratic-leaning changes, according to the Alliance of Independent Journalists, 19 articles were identified in the Draft Criminal Code of Indonesia that could criminalize the work of journalists. Some examples of these are the likes of a five-year sentence for insulting the president or the vice president, one and a half years for insulting the government, and several more. Without free speech for criticism, journalists would not be able to deliver the right messages, messages that society needs to hear about, especially on the fallacies and mistakes of the government. Therefore, raising the question to the government, is saying the truth bad? Free speech, after all, is not only crucial for society to know and understand what is happening in their own country, but rather it's crucial to know whether a government is performing properly and cleanly. And of course, many controversies are going to indeed surround the government. These are just among the many more samples out there. But do you think that they're going in the right direction? Well, maybe economically, but how about free speech? Let us know your thoughts down below. Thanks for watching.